this is Congressional Update with Ayanna Presley, the seventh district congresswoman from Massachusetts. I'm Sarah Fishman. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing wonderful. It's good to be with you again. Yes. It's been almost a year. I had to look at my little calendar. It's been about 10 months. And you've been very busy. So let's just go right into it. Um Let's start with something that you've been working on recently, uh, housing emergencies, eviction prevention uh, bill that you submitted. You wanna talk about that for a bit? Sure. Um, well, Sarah, um, I serve on the Financial Services Committee. And in that committee, we tackle issues, um, obviously financial services and banking, um, credit reporting, uh, being unbanked, underbanked, housing, homelessness, student debt. And in serving on that committee, you know, we, we learned that uh, pre-pandemic, there were some 3.7 million eviction filings. And mm -hmm. I do consider that to be really a, a public health crisis mm -hmm. um, and one that is 100% preventable. You know, e eviction is a policy choice and it is a violent one at that. And the reason why I say that eviction is a, is a public health crisis is because we know that housing is a critical social determinant of health. It's foundational uh, to everything. So pre-pandemic, we had a crisis and that crisis has only been exacerbated by um, this global pandemic and this pandemic induced recession, which has caused unprecedented economic hardship. Mm -hmm. And when we see that eviction moratoriums um, are coming to a close and will expire uh, imminently, including in Somerville uh, in April. Um, that is why I've uh, introduced the HELP Act, which would quite literally um, provide help um, to those uh, on the brink of or threatened by eviction, it would provide them with the legal counsel to know their rights. And we know that uh, only 10% of those who have been threatened with eviction uh, when they show up at court uh, even have legal counsel or representation. And so uh, this would, uh, having legal representation would improve those outcomes. It would also um, prevent a lot of the unjust evictions that occur. Um, the HELP Act would require landlords to inform tenants of their rights. Um, and then uh, moreover, if someone is evicted, uh, this would ensure that their lives are not uh, permanently ruined um, because that eviction would not be on your credit report. It would not be reported. I never knew. I never knew that. And it's on there for seven years. Is that correct? Absolutely. And you know, are your, your credit uh, report uh, is critical to uh, gainful employment, mm -hmm. um, to securing housing. Uh, and so when you have that eviction on your credit report, um, it often stands in the way of, of someone being able to um, gain future housing. Uh, and of course, there's been a, a disparate impact on those uh, single-headed households, particularly those uh, Black female uh, single-headed households uh, who have been uh, the most vulnerable uh, to eviction. And so that's why we've introduced the HELP Act. Um, as we see eviction moratoriums expiring again uh, in Somerville, that will be in April. And eviction is um, violent. It's a policy choice. It's 100% preventable. And we must do everything at every level of government uh, to prevent people from being evicted. And so the Health Act will give people uh, access to legal representation, they'll know their rights, help to improve those outcomes, prevent unjust evictions. And then um, if someone is unfortunately evicted, uh, it will not go on their credit report. So there's, is it $10 billion for legal counsel? That's correct. For? Okay, so That's do, you, do you have a source for that money or is that, not to be determined now because it's it's not an appropriation, it's just an authorization? Well, that's right. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do believe, um, you know, there is not a deficit of, of resource. Um, you know, there is a deficit as evidenced by a $750 you know, billion defense budget. Um, you know, I think that um, it's, there's a deficit of empathy and mm -hmm. um, eviction is 100% preventable. It is a public health crisis. And uh, we see that uh, Black women are three times as likely to have evictions filed against them um, that are ultimately dismissed. But they still leave a negative mark that remains on the credit report again for seven years. And in Massachusetts, Black renters are more than two times as likely to have an eviction filed against them. So 
uh, this is a, a public health issue. It is an economic justice issue. It is a racial justice issue. And uh, moreover, not only is housing a human right, but we certainly should be doing everything in our power to ensure that people remain safely housed while we are still very much in the midst of a pandemic. So this might be barking up the completely wrong tree, but do you have an opinion on rent control vis-a-vis -vis this kind of thing? Um, when I first moved here, there was rent control in Cambridge and then that went away. And yeah, I mean, look, the reason why there are some 3.7 million eviction filings and you know, I think there are people who like to stereotype, um, you know, this issue, but therefore, for the grace of God, go all of us. When people <clears throat> are increasingly not working at a living wage, when, um, you know, rent is skyrocketing and, you know, wages aren't keeping pace, um, when women are not uh, being paid, um, you know, on, pa on par with our, um, our white male, our counterparts. So there's a, there are pay inequities. Um, you know, this is... Uh, the threat exists for everyone. It's not yeah. because people aren't uh, working, even though we do see with the pandemic induced recession, um, you know, high unemployment. Well, but you in, in my own household, my mother uh, worked very hard and took pride in paying her bills on time. But sometimes you just suffer a life disruptive event that stands in the way. And, and so we faced, um, you know, eviction uh, in my own household and it's, it's traumatic for everyone. So I support rent stabilization you know, absolutely. You know, again, just uh, when you contextualize it amongst those other variables that I just enumerated, um, you know, housing is a human right and everyone deserves more than just shelter. They deserve a home. Um, mm -hmm. And on the Financial Services Committee, I'm also doing the work of ensuring that um, the dream of home ownership um, mm -hmm. is um, within reach for more people, particularly with Black home ownership. It's the lowest now than it's been uh, since the FHA was introduced, and that contributes considerably to the racial wealth gap, which is very persistent in the Massachusetts 7. Yeah, and as you pointed out, things got worse in 2008, 2009 with all that economic change. All right, I'm going to, let's switch to um, masks mandated um, or not. Uh, you have an, a strong opinion about this, about what Governor Baker just decided to do. So can you just quickly say what, what it is that he's done that you um, are concerned about? Sure. Well, look, I, I, I get that there is fan, uh, pandemic fatigue that is real. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is... Um, impacted the public health, our, our quality of life. People are, are tired of being masked up or tired of restrictions. Unfortunately, the pandemic is not yet finished with us. And, you know, I'm a real stickler for data. Um, and in fact, early in the pandemic, tenants of my bill, the Equitable Data Collection Act, were included in the relief package to mandate the CDC to collect and disaggregate and report in real time racial demographic data. Um, because I believe, you know, you can't manage what you don't know. And I wanted to make sure that pandemic response uh, was commiserate with the disparate impact that we were seeing. And so if you follow the data and you follow the science, you know, we still have very high rates of transmission in all of our counties. And as I talk to parents and educators and all of the superintendents in my district uh, and students, and my district includes, or the seventh includes uh, Somerville, um, Cambridge, Boston, Randolph, Everett, Chelsea, and Milton. And uh, there are real fears and concerns. When I talk to young people uh, who are being raised in grand family households, they're being raised by their grandparents um, who are immunocompromised, uh, um, young people who have their own pre existing conditions and feel uh, vulnerable, um, educators who fear um, getting sick and, and making their, their loved ones sick, I had an educator who um, who just, uh, he and his wife just had their first child and he was fearful of bringing the virus, you know, back home uh, to uh, his new baby who's too young to be vaccinated right. and, uh, and to his wife. And when I speak with superintendents, they remind us of what happened when restrictions were um, dropped at the last break. And when students returned from that break, uh, there were outbreaks uh, mm -hmm. in our schools. And I care about the entire a learning community from custodian to food service worker, administrator, educator, a student, um, and the community writ large. Well, this is a matter of the public health. Yeah. And so we have to follow the science and the data. 
And I'm paying attention to what the CDC is going to offer when it comes to mask uh, guidance uh, and guidelines. But the greatest wealth of our commonwealth is the health of our people. And that's what we need to continue to uh, prioritize. And we have to also, I'm looking to the CDC for uh, standardized metrics mm -hmm. because we cannot have um, arbitrary decisions being made uh, when it comes to the public health. So we have to have standardized metrics that we are all following and working under. And so for me, that, it, that should include everything from um, our ICU beds, hospitalization rates, transmission rates. Uh, and so that's why I think that it's too early uh, to be uh, loosening um, our restrictions and to lifting mask mandates when it comes to indoors. Yes, I think, schools. I think uh, Mayor Wu in Boston said she could foresee also lifting that the city's mask mandate, but depended upon three metrics. I don't think she said which three, at least not in what I read. And that was sort of my next question to you. This is a very squirrely kind of process and there, there are gonna be ebbs and flows. And so I, I guess your answer is it, focus on the numbers to, to determine how to move forward. Absolutely. Right? And we just, you know, this is in the interest of the public health. It, it's a matter of, um, of, of life and death. And, um, you know, I, moreover, I do believe that we should be sort of hardening our infrastructure, if you will, um, because we didn't see Delta coming, we didn't see Omicron coming. And, you know, we've all been caught flat footed. This is unprecedented in every way. We've never experienced any, a pandemic uh, in our lifetime. Um, and with new uh, variants uh, emerging, um, you know, I think it, it's best that um, we continue to follow the science and the data and that we not move in a way that is short-sighted, reckless, and danger, dangerous, because it is quite la literally a matter of life and death. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I should or shouldn't ask you this, but how do you feel about vaccine mandates? Um, the Somerville Board of Health last uh, month was contemplating imposing a vaccine requirement for being in public places, but then decided not to have that be the case, um, the rationale being that the the caseload for COVID relative to other places nearby was low and that the vaccination rate relative to other places was high, about 80%. So in Somerville. So does that all make sense to you or does it make sense to you to have some sort of vaccination requirement or? Well, let me just say this again, as someone who really focuses on, uh, on the data to tell the full story, and we've had to continue to push uh, for that data collection, that we'd be vigilant in that. <clears throat> so as I said, my legislation was included in the relief package um, <clears throat> to ensure that we would collect racial demographic data that'd be mandated, disaggregated, reported in real time. And we've continued to, to push for the collection of uh, data uh, when it comes to vaccination rates, uh, to booster shots, and to breakthrough cases. And more recently, um, I've pushed for the collection of data when it comes to long COVID. And the reason why I'm bringing that up, uh, Sarah, is because okay. what? You know, long COVID. Oh, low COVID. Okay. Long, long, you know, uh, long. what we call okay. long haulers, right? So uh, my point is that um, the numbers don't always tell the full story. So people um, continue to characterize the Omicron as um, a mild variant. Um, but this is not something that you want to get. No. You know, we are still... Uh, wrapping our, our arms around uh, what are the long-term implications. There are many disability justice advocates who said early on in the pandemic that this could be a mass disabling event. Uh, and so I'm leaning in very hard um, with this growing constituency of COVID long haulers who have experienced everything from um, fibromyalgia uh, to respiratory challenges, uh, to strokes, to um, extreme and chronic fatigue and paying attention to that. So my point is, um, we're still learning about this virus, we're still learning about these variants, and we need to do everything in our power to ensure that we stop the spread of this, um, of this virus. And um, so I'm, I'm going to continue to uh, ensure and fight that we be vigilant. And so, um, you know, yes, I've been, I've been supportive of, of vaccine mandates, um, because this is a matter of the public health. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly understand 
as a, a Black woman, uh, the hesitancy of many, especially marginalized uh, communities, given a history of medical apartheid and a violation of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I fought for uh, millions of dollars to be secured and those dollars to federally to be nimble dollars that could be used locally to meet people where they are so that you could stipend people as canvassers uh, to go to their homes so that we could have mobile units so that we could do the education necessary. Um, so hopefully to assuage people's you know, fears or anxieties. But this is uh, in, in the best interest of the public health uh, for us to, um, uh, to pursue every protection necessary. I have, a, I have a friend who's doing this work through Cambridge Health Alliance, and she says it's, it's amazing, it's rewarding, it's very useful to go from city to city. So uh, I guess we say keep on keeping on. Now, right? Sarah, can I also just add that there's a residual of you know, impact here. So again, when you're looking at the numbers and, and the data, um, it was heartbreaking for me to, to meet the parents of a 16-year-old um, who, because of uh, what was happening in our hospitals and an inability to get um, a, an appointment, a follow-up appointment uh, for a, um, a, a skin cancer, that that is now uh, completely uh, malignant and metastasized. Um, and, and I wish that I could tell you that that story was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of preventative care that hasn't been able to happen, um, you know, follow-ups, uh, surgeries and things like that. Mammograms. Um, it, mammograms, exactly. Oh, you know, yeah. so there's a, there was, there's a residual impact here on our healthcare system. And so either way you look at it, either way you slice it, it's, it's a matter of life and death. And so it's important that we just continue to remain vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. And affecting everyone, affecting some people disproportionately, but affecting everyone at some level. That's right. Um, OK, let's switch to uh, a different sort of thing. Um, I keep wanting to say senator, so excuse me. President Biden um, made a campaign promise that if there were uh, a vacancy on the Supreme Court, he would nominate a black woman for that position. So my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, that right after Stephen Breyer announced he was gonna retire, you tweeted, is that right? You tweeted the president and said, remember what you said, this campaign promise, is that true? Yes, myself and, and many other advocates. And, you know, was we're very, uh, you know, heartened and encouraged to see that um, shortly thereafter, the President Biden did in fact, um, make it plain uh, that he would make good on that promise. And then then you and some colleagues wrote a letter to him and you went beyond the promise. And do you wanna say what it is? Uh, so I don't- Sure. Over well, that, okay. So Sarah, you know, here, here's the thing is that we have seen uh, with the current imbalance and the far right extremism uh, of the Supreme Court, we have seen them obstruct the will of the people. Uh, when it comes to voting rights, when it comes to uh, housing rights, uh, when it comes um, to reproductive freedom, uh, we have seen them obstruct the will of the people. So the Supreme Court is currently uh, imbalanced um, mm. and again, uh, uh, overwrought with um, far right uh, extremism. And so it's important that we restore fairness and balance uh, to the courts. And there have been 115 uh, Supreme Court justices and 100 of them uh, have been white men. And um, I certainly have seen uh, as a voter, notwithstanding even my own election, the benefit and the difference that it makes when you have a diversity of perspective, opinion and thought around policy and decision-making tables, a diversity of lived experience. It does a disservice to all of us uh, when solutions are being developed through a completely monolithic and homogenized prism. So uh, President Biden recognizes that. Uh, that's why he made that pledge and that promise on the campaign trail. I'm glad that he will uh, honor it now and will uh, have the first uh, a nomination of a, a Black woman to the Supreme Court. And I'm going to work hard to make sure that that nomination becomes a confirmation. Um, but, you know, who is there matters as well. And given the imbalance and the unfairness, um, I do think it's important that we have someone um, that, that has a record on and is committed to, to racial justice, uh, to economic justice, um, and, to, uh, and to reproductive justice. 
So a couple of questions. First of all, does this person have to be a judge, a sitting judge? Do you have an opinion on that? You know, I won't place any any criteria on that because, um, you know, even when I, I ran for, for city council and ran for Congress, people had their uh, their own um, sort of predeterminants of what qualified someone uh, to be in uh, in these positions. And and I didn't have uh, those things. So uh, far be it from me to place those sorts of uh, criteria. You know? well, that, is, that is a very elegant answer. Um, so there are a bunch of people that are being considered. Um, and uh, oh, we didn't really discuss. So in the letter that you sent, you said that you wanted the group of you wanted to have not just a, a, a black woman nominated, but someone whose early career or prior career mirrored that of Thurgood Marshall before he was a Supreme Court justice. So that's that's very that's even more telling and and specific. Yes, and 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 I and I should um, just highlight that that letter um, that I was very proud to be a part of uh, was um, submitted. Um, by uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, so all Black women. Um, and uh, there is not currently, uh, when you talk about sort of the confirmation process, there is not currently a one Black woman serving uh, in the United States Senate. Um, and so uh, in that uh, we are calling on President Biden to make good on his promise and his pledge, and he has said that he would do that, um, the Black women uh, in the House of Representatives and the Congressional Black Caucus um, decided to put this letter together and I um, just to talk about, uh, you know, the yeah. criteria uh, when it comes to, to track record um, yeah. that we would hope would be taken into consideration. So if one goes by that letter, which of course it's not a litmus test, but yeah. it seems like at least one or two candidates really stand out. So um, Sherilyn Eiffel, who is I believe she's president and like chief lawyer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And she's the seventh. This is what I like about the show is it makes me learn stuff. About <laughs> is that she's, this is what we like about your show too, because uh, yeah, as no, you're but, learning, so is your audience. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so easy not to know stuff. Anyway, so, she, so she's the seventh president of that organization, which was founded by Thurgood Marshall in 1940. So that kind of like, you know, blows your mind if you're thinking, well, this is who we want. And, but of course that's not, there, there are many things that one could bring to the table that would make them a, a good justice. Um, Absolutely. And what, and I'll just say that I, I, I certainly, I think it's important that we not allow um, you know, black women to be pitted against one another. Right, you know, right. this is a, a historic inflection point uh, for our country. And, um, you know, uh, we're talking about the Supreme Court. And so I'll use a pun and say we have a very deep bench of extraordinary and exemplary uh, uh, black women candidates. Right. And, um, you know, I am, uh, I think it's important that we hold space for and be celebratory uh, about that. So now, given that I've re read the GRID article interview that you had, I yeah. know that you named some names. Can you tell us who you think might be particularly a good candidate of the names that have been circulating? <laughs> Sarah. Well, you, you just named uh, one, one I, I, you're trying to give me a trouble, but, um, but you just, uh, <laughs> but you just, uh, you know, you always get in trouble. I would you not know. try to get when, my when you, when you start naming names. I just said we have a deep vent. So you run the yeah. risk of, you know, leaving someone out. But, you know, how about I just be unapologetically parochial and say that, um, I, you know, looking at Massachusetts, we have uh, someone who I think would be extraordinary in Chief Justice uh, Kimberly Butt. And, and a lot of these women are quite young. I mean, one of them is 45. I mean, that would be, you know. All right, so we don't have a whole lot more time here. Um, so I wanna briefly talk, segue to uh, voting rights and the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis that. So what, I guess there's a dual thing going on. So Congress is, not acting on, not passing certain pieces of legislation which would protect voting rights. And the Supreme Court is taking up cases and affirming practices that also undermine. So you have 
you have sort of two tracks of things going in the wrong direction if protecting civil rights is your goal. So what, uh, this is very broad, what, what do you see as being the most important thing or things that we need to try to make sure are established to protect those rights? Given, given that these other things have happened, are there specific things like same day election registration? Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Well, first, let me just say that, um, you know, the House did do its job, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you'll have to forgive me. I get sensitive when people say Congress. It's like the House did its job, you know? Right. The, the obstruction keeps happening on the Senate side, okay? But, you know, we have moved um, uh, legislation, you know, out of the House and then in the Senate, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, there were some who were uh, prioritizing the preservation of antiquated uh, Senate processes, like the, the filibuster, the filibuster yeah. um, uh, just days after Dr. King's birthday. And Dr. King, you know, uh, spoke often about the ways in which the filibuster was obstructing uh, progress and justice. And that's still true today. And so there were, were some who choose to prioritize the preservation of a Jim Crow filibuster over the preservation of democracy, despite the fact um, that we have um, some 19 states that have passed voter suppression laws, some 49 states who have intro introduced laws. Um, and there has been a, uh, you know, a precise and coordinated uh, effort to uh, undermine free and fair elections in, and to question the integrity of ballots in red states. Uh, and of course, uh, in Washington, we survived an insurrection, you know, uh, by uh, people who considered themselves to be patriots, um, but who sought to uh, interrupt the transfer, the peaceful transfer of power and the ratifying of the Electoral College. So the preservation of our democracy has never been more important uh, than in this moment. And because of the obstruction of the Senate, um, that is why we need states and municipalities to really be the tip of the spear, if you will. And so uh, in Massachusetts, um, there, there is a bill uh, that recently uh, passed the House now. It did not include uh, same-day registration. It didn't. I was, I was su so surprised to find out we don't have that because I think it's New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island have some form of it, but Massachusetts doesn't. Is that something, I mean, I know it's state level, but is that something you can advocate for? Oh, I, I did. You know, okay. I'm not someone who abdicates my responsibility to lead on those issues of, of consequence to my constituents just because it's state and I'm federal. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we all have to be uh, very, very uh, coordinated in this work at every level of government, whether you're talking about uh, beating back uh, a pandemic or whether you're talking about uh, preserving our democracy. Uh, and so I, I did lean in and advocate very hard for a same day registration to uh, be included. There was an amendment offered by State Representative Nika Algardo. Unfortunately, uh, it was not successful. Um, what, what was included, and, and we'll, we'll keep fighting to get same day registration in there, uh, was uh, mail in voting, mm -hmm. uh, early voting, mm -hmm. and um, jail based uh, voting, mm -hmm. um, because we know that those that are behind the wall, which are disproportionately um, uh, black and brown are disenfranchised uh, mm -hmm. in having access to the ballot. And so um, those are some of the top line measures that were included. Um, so, but federally we have to, you know, keep this fight up and uh, I'm focused on growing our majority by two in the Senate so that we can abolish the filibuster and restore voting rights and in the practice of partisan gerrymandering, um, you know, and so many other abusive um, efforts which seek to undermine our democracy and to disenfranchise um, every person having access uh, to the ballot. These current efforts uh, disproportionately impact, um, you know, these draconian efforts disproportionately impact uh, Black Americans, um, the disabled community, uh, low-income communities, the elderly. Uh, and it is in direct response, and I believe a backlash to historic and unprecedented uh, voter turnout in, in 2000, uh, just you know, a little over a year ago, uh, mm -hmm. which made this democratic majority uh, possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I see it as a backlash and an affront. Is there a, any way that this, that you could be the devil's advocate, that, that this could be perceived as a partisan issue? You know, specifically when you talk about how many people there are on the Supreme Court, which you've spoken about perhaps seeing it expanded. Is there any way that someone could say, oh, well, this is just partisan politics. This isn't really enlarging 
or projecting. Well, you know, I mean, that's what's so frustrating about the moment that we find ourselves in, but I don't have the luxury of being cynical or apathetic, but it is incredibly frustrating. Um, We've seen a pandemic uh, politicized. Uh, We see uh, voting rights being politicized when uh, in the past, this has been a bipartisan issue. Um, The right to vote is sacred, it's fundamental to our democracy. Um, And up until very recently, that was not something that was uh, being questioned. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, so it, it, it it is not uh, partisan, you know, our our democracy and the preservation of it um, it is not partisan. And so far as your point about expanding the Supreme Court, there's precedence for that. Uh, Seven times uh, previously, you know, Congress has expanded uh, the Supreme Court. And I do think that is certainly something that should be considered. And there is legislation uh, that I'm a co-sponsor and supportive of. Um, and again, I think the goal here is that we need to restore balance and fairness to the courts. Uh, it is currently uh, imbalanced um, and uh, the far right extremism of the Supreme Court uh, has really obstructed the will of the people. On that note, we have to end. This okay. has been a Congressional Update with Ayanna Presley. Have a good day. Thank you.